Hi there, this is Don McGlynn, and I'm the producer and director of Ed Thigpen, Master of Time, Rhythm, and Taste. It's one of my favorite films in a lot of ways because the subject of it was Ed Thigpen, who was a good friend of mine. In this podcast today, you're going to be hearing about Ed's life when he moved to New York City and when he met his first wife. And this part in particular is kind of fun because you hear a lot of personal reminiscences from his very, very close friend, Donald Mead, and also Billy Taylor. Uh, Billy Taylor was a, he had a great trio in the 1950s, and Ed was the drummer in that trio. And they were frequently on this TV show called The Subject is Jazz. And when you hear uh, this long drum solo from Ed, it is preceded by a really nice, interesting statement about what the music is and what the music means to him and where he thought it came from. Most of the rest of this podcast is about when Ed became a really huge star because he was part of one of the most popular jazz bands in the country was the Oscar Peterson Trio. It was Oscar, Ray Brown, and Ed that were in this uh, band. And a little bit later, he ended up um, joining Ella Fitzgerald and toured with her a lot. Um, As this podcast continues, you'll find, though, that uh, Ed started to reevaluate his whole life because, you know, in the 1960s, early 1970s, a lot of people were saying, particularly African Americans, like, what does my life mean? case of Ed, it was what does his religious life mean, and what is he doing with his career, and, you know, he tried to make sense out of everything, so he was soul-searching. So this is a very interesting podcast, and I hope you enjoy it. New York, at that time, it was like a movie set. It was a great time, man. This beautiful young lady walks in, she's hanging, and I'm thinking, wow, Ava Gardner or somebody, you know. And I, my eyes drop, and we make contact. We start hanging out together. Her name was Lois. A day with her was an experience. Totally. She, she could cover the whole map. And she was a special lady. She was in the fast track. She, she knew the size. She was much more hip than I was, you know. She was a take-charge person who could do it probably better than anyone I've ever met. We got married, and I had this, that's, that was it. Ed was, was a unique uh, person. When I first met him, uh, I tried to get him to join my trio, and he didn't feel he was ready for, for the things that I was doing. So when I finally convinced him that he should uh, come with me, it was, it was a wonderful addition because he brought so much to the, the music that I, I was uh, trying to, to do in those days. He was, was someone that I cared a lot about because he, he was a very special musician and a, a very special friend. The subject is jazz. When we did the subject is jazz, uh, that series was the first uh, uh, ever done on a public television here in, in the States. I'm very proud of, of, of all the things that we did there. Billy Taylor was the musical coordinator of this 13-part series that covered the various phases of jazz history. I felt very strongly about the cultural aspects of uh, uh, teaching the music as I have been taught. Now, to get new sounds out of drums and cymbals might seem virtually an impossibility. So tell us, Edmund, what were you actually looking for? Well, I was looking for a way in which to express myself, not only rhythmically, but uh, musically. So I had to find tones, sound of, of a tone quality. So I found it, I knew I could do this on the drum. You uh, get effects from classical and legitimate training uh, when you're using the cymbal for uh, ocean and so forth. From the African rhythms and the Afro-Cuban rhythms, I learned about conversation between drums. So therefore, I've tried to combine both of these using the jazz set as it is. In effect, you are transferring African-Cuban sounds to the regular instruments of jazz. That's correct. By that time, we were saying uh, verbally things that our our elders had not been able to say uh, about why the music was important culturally. Uh, what uh, what jazz was, in, in our opinion, uh, why it deserved this kind of attention. Something that had not been said musically and, and verbally that was being said.
very uh, hurt by the fact that he went to, with Oscar, Oscar Peterson. Uh, but I knew that that was the right thing for him to do. I mean, so it, 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 I never said anything uh, to dissuade him for doing it, because I knew how important it was for him, him to do it. I mean, that was the time for him to do just that thing at that time. Ed, I remember, was very uh, worried that he was going to be able to make it with the Peterson Trio because Oscar was very demanding, uh, but he certainly did. It's said that there was two major rhythm sections in the last century, Count Basie, Walter Page thing, and the Oscar Peterson, Ray Brown, and Ed thing. Those two probably personified what rhythm section was about. That whole time with Oscar, Ray introduced me to golf, and our lifestyle was the jazz lifestyle, our top group and all that stuff. We played a week at a time in places, sometimes two weeks, hit a London house sometimes almost a month in one place. So we'd carry the cookware, we took the car, the golf clubs, and we played golf about five days a week, and Ray looked at me and said, he called me Pine. Pine, you, ever, you know one day you may look back and think, we may be living some of the best days of our life right now. And I always remember that, particularly when things are going so well. That you may be living some of the best times of your life, so enjoy it. January 1959 to June 4th or 5th, uh, 1965. Six and a half years. As a matter of fact, he right here in Copenhagen was my last job at Tivoli with Oscar. I wish that association had lasted longer because I love Ray, I love Oscar, and I loved Ed, and I thought that all three worked oh, just beyond what was expected of a rhythm section. Well, it was time for a change like many things in life. He had some other ideas. I was basically going in another way. It had served his time. Even though Ed ended up leaving the Oscar Peterson trio, he was not unemployed for long. As a matter of fact, he ended up having his longest musical association with Ella Fitzgerald. Oh, it was wonderful. One of the best times I ever had in my life. Ella was a dream. She was a dream to be with. She was a sweet people person. She liked me, and I felt it all the time. We used to go. When discos were happening, we used to go disco dancing after the gig. It was happy time. It was, got on the bandstand, and she was another person who was so consistent. Uh, the greeting that she'd get, ah, Ella Fitzgerald, wow. It was just, you know, it was magical, man. And she was magic on the bandstand. Ed was enjoying a great deal of success in the 1960s, but there were also a lot of social changes going on, and this was affecting Ed a great deal. Materially, I was doing fine. I was with Ella Fitzgerald. I had studio work. I had some little piece of land, partial owner in Palm Springs, a car, a nice home in Wilshire District. But there was an emptiness. The Panthers had been here. We had the last big civil rights movement had gone through. Identity of who you are. I looked up one day and said, well, what am I anyway? You feel pulled this way, this way. And when it got to the point where it was beginning to choke me and my identity and whatever, whatever I was about, I had to go research, you know, American, your whole American passport. What do I know about the United States? So I buy a constitution of the United States and this and this. I'm Negro at the time, then you're getting to be black or whatever it is. What do you know about it? So then you go back into Negro history and start studying about that. You profess Christianity, but what do you know about it? And you profess practicing it through Catholicism. What do you know about that? So you go get the Bible, you start this, and you start talking to priests, you do this, you do this, and this. And all this introspection had an impact on his marriage. I stayed with Lois, we were together for 13 years. I went through an annulment, a dispensation of the, of the uh, relationship. I don't think it was made in heaven. You know, very few things are. 
Now, it wasn't a bad life, but it was just a decision I had made that not valid under my religious beliefs. Hey Boppers, Keon here, and you just heard the fourth part of six in our series on Ed Thigpen. In this episode, we saw a glimpse of what Ed's life was like at the height of his career, first with Billy Taylor, then with Oscar Peterson, and ultimately Ella Fitzgerald. We also got a glimpse of how Ed approached his craft and place in the world in the 60s, and how that began a search to find himself. These podcasts are called from the documentary Ed Thigpen, Master of Time, Rhythm, and Taste, directed by Don McGlynn, edited by Frank Atkinson and Christian Mulkeelid, with sound by Thomas Martin. Bop is produced by Don McGlynn, co-produced by Mark Canner and Franny Alfano, and edited by me, Keon Vaziri. Until next time, thanks.